Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Hearts in Atlantis by Stephen King. So I do have a dust jacket somewhere. It's a very battered dust jacket. So we've got a blurb here, so I'm going to read the blurb. Bloody hell, it's a long old blurb. And then um, I'm going to go through and share some of my thoughts and feelings with you as I go along. So, although it is difficult to believe, the 60s are not fictional. They actually happened. That's from the author's note. Stephen King, whose first novel, Carrie, was published in 1974, the year before the last US troops withdrew from Vietnam, is the first hugely popular writer of the TV generation. Images from that war, and the protests against it, had flooded America's living rooms for a decade. Hearts in Atlantis is composed of five interconnected sequential narratives set in the years from 1960 to 1999. Each story is deeply rooted in the 60s, and each is haunted by the Vietnam War. In part one, low men in yellow coats, 11-year-old Bobby Garfield discovers a world of predatory malice in his own neighbourhood. He also discovers that adults are sometimes not rescuers, but are the heart of the terror. In the title story, a bunch of college kids get hooked on a card game, discover the possibility of protest, and confront their own collective heart of darkness, where laughter is sometimes no more than the thinly disguised cry of the beast. In Blind Willie and Why We're in Vietnam, Two men who grew up with Bobby in suburban Connecticut try to fill the emptiness of the post-Vietnam era in an America that sometimes seems as hollow and as haunted as their own lives. And in Heavenly Shades of Night Are Falling, this remarkable book's denouement, Bobby returns to his hometown where one final secret, the hope of redemption, and his heart's desire may await him. Full of danger, full of suspense, most of all full of heart, Stephen King's new book will take some readers to a place they have never been, and others to a place they have never been able to completely leave. Dun dun dun. So we will start with low men in yellow coats. 1960, they had a stick sharpened at both ends. So we get this little bit of dialogue here, which I like because I like this song. Me and Dave actually did it as the Elk. Um, it's my band. I'll link below. I've got a YouTube channel. <laughs> uh, Sully started away. Sully started away, then turned back. Man, you know what? I saw a couple of weird guys when I came into the park. What was weird about them? Sully John shook his head, looking puzzled. Don't know, he said. Don't really know. Then he headed off singing at the hop. It was one of his favourites. Bobby liked it too. Danny and the juniors were great. They were great. I agree. And we get this little line here. I'm not a bad guy. Never robbed a bank or stole a military secret. I spent too much of my life reading books and scamped on my share of fines. If there were library police, I'm afraid they'd be after me. But I'm not a bad guy like the ones you see on television. There are library police. We know this from King's other books. I think it's four past midnight. We get this little bit too, which, which uh, Dark Tower fans will uh, appreciate. There will be water if God wills it, and they may pass by. All things serve. Serve what? Almost whispering now. Serve what, Ted? All things serve the beam, Ted said, and suddenly his hands closed over Bobby's. So I want to read this little passage out here because this mentions The Exorcist, which is one of my favourite horror novels. Uh, I think it's actually really underrated, personally. Uh, Ted talked of William Golding and what he called dystopian fantasy went on to H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, suggesting a link between the Morlocks and the Eloy and Jack and Ralph on Golding's Island. He talked about what he called literature's only excuses, which he said were exploring the questions of innocence and experience, good and evil. Near the end of this impromptu lecture, he mentioned a novel called The Exorcist, which dealt with both these questions in the popular context, and then stopped abruptly. He shook his head as if to clear it. What's wrong? Bobby took a sip of his root beer. He still didn't like it much, but it was the only soft drink in the fridge. Besides, it was cold. What am I thinking? Ted passed a hand over his brow, as if he'd suddenly developed a headache. That one hasn't been written yet. What do you mean? Nothing. I'm rambling. But I just thought that was cool because this has taken place in the 60s, so it hasn't been written yet. Alright, sorry about the dip in phone quality. I just dropped my camera and broke it. Oops. Anyway, here are some more King tabs. We get a reference here to some regulators. Uh, which I assume are the same as the regulators in the novel, The Regulators. I haven't actually read that yet. And we find out that Ted is a breaker and uh, he's wanted by the Crimson King. We have this little bit here, which I think is interesting for Dark Tower fans. I doubt if the Crimson King will thank you for a meaningless pretty if it interferes with his plans, Ted said. There is a gunslinger. Gunslinger, pa. Yet yeah, he and his friends have reached the borderland of Endworld, Ted said, and now he was the one who sounded thoughtful. If I give you what you want instead of forcing you to take it, I may be able to speed things up by 50 years or more. As you say, I'm a breaker, made for it and born to it. There aren't many of us. You need everyone, and most of all, you need me, because I'm the best. And uh, we get this one, uh, Bobby thinks, there are other worlds than this, millions of worlds, all turning on the spindle of the tower. So uh, yeah, that was a pretty good story, I enjoyed that. That brings us up to Hearts in Atlantis. And I thought this was quite timely as well, because it's relevant even to us today, but um, 
So this is the start of Hearts in Atlantis. It's set in the later 60s. I learned a lot in college, the very least of it in the classrooms. I learned how to kiss a girl and put on a rubber at the same time, a necessary but often overlooked skill. How to chug a 16 ounce can of beer without throwing up. How to make extra cash in my spare time, writing term papers for kids with more money than I, which was most of them. How not to be a Republican even though I had sprung from a long line of them. How to go into the streets with a sign held up over my head chanting, one, two, three, four, we won't fight your fucking war, and hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? I learned that you should try to get downwind of tear gas and breathe slowly through a handkerchief or a bandana if you couldn't do that. I learned that when the nightsticks come out, you want, you want to fall on your side, draw your knees up to your chest, and cover the back of your head with your hands. In Chicago in 1968, I learned that cops can beat the shit out of you no matter how well you cover up. Nobody gives a hand job like a Catholic girl. I've changed my mind about a lot of things in the course of my life, but never about that. I, of course, couldn't comment whether I have any experience of that. Uh, and I thought this was interesting until we get here. Hey, what's that? Nate asked. He had stopped and was looking over his shoulder. Skip and I also stopped and looked back. I started to ask Nate what he meant and then saw. Jones was wearing a jeans jacket. On the back of it, drawn in what looked like black magic marker and just visible in the declining light of that early autumn evening, was a shape in a circle. Dunno, Skip said. It looks like a sparrow track. The boy on the crutches merged into the crowds on their way to another commons dinner on another Thursday night in another October. Most of the boys were clean shaven. Most of the girls wore skirts and ship and shore blouses with Peter Pan collars. The moon was rising almost full, casting orange light on them. The full blown age of freaks was still two years away and none of the three of us realized we'd seen the peace sign for the first time. Hello all. So we've got some more hearts in Atlantis here. Um, I finished reading the story Hearts in Atlantis, so now I'm on to Blind Willie. Uh, but yeah, I've got a few more notes. Do you want this biggie? Because you like these, don't you? Nom nom nom. Go and eat it. No, I'll put it down there for you. You can do what you like with it. I thought this was quite a good little line here. It says, um, I didn't shave in cream dairy's door, I said. More nettled than ever. Yeah, but you're playing cards with the asshole who did. Lending him credibility. I think it was the first time I heard that word, which went on to have an incredibly sleazy career in the 70s and coke-soaked 80s, mostly in politics. I think credibility died of shame around 1986, just as all those 60s war protesters and fearless battlers for racial equality were discovering junk bonds, Martha Stewart living and the Stairmaster. And then this really shocked me because I've talked to this to one of my friends, I have this theory, it's not really theory, I talk about the grey people. Um, basically some people are just like very colourless and grey and then some people are really colourful and so I kind of make it my mission to gather the colourful people around me basically. I think he's a colourful person aren't you? And it was just really weird that <laughs> this came up in the story. I was a little shocked but Stoke smiled. It was a real smile, too sunny and unaffected. The crutches aren't relevant he said. Time's too short to waste, that's relevant. People around here don't know what's happening and they, d and they don't care. They're grey people, just getting by people. In Orono, Maine, buying a Rolling Stones record passes for a revolutionary act. Some people know more than they did, I said. But I was troubled by thoughts of Nate, who had been worried his mother might see a picture of him getting arrested and had stayed on the curb in consequence. A face in the background, the face of a grey boy on the road to dentistry in the 20th century. Just really strange to me that King, you know, is using the same, same concept, I suppose. Maybe I stole it from him, I don't know. Uh, and in this, here we get another reference to the Lord of the Flies. I opened the package. Inside it, and in jarring contrast to the cheery Christmas paper and white satin ribbon, was a paperback copy of Lord of the Flies by William Golding. I'd somehow missed it in high school, opting for a separate piece in senior lit instead because piece looked a little shorter. Right, can we just clarify here, Stephen King, that's a bit sloppy writing for you there, mate, because why would you say I had somehow missed it and then immediately explain exactly how you missed it? Sloppy, sloppy King. Still one hell of a writer though. I almost missed it, um, but we have here as well this little bit about the peace symbol, which I didn't know. Um, that symbol is based on British semaphore and stands for nuclear disarmament. It was invented by a famous British philosopher. I think he might even be a knight. To say the Russians made it up. Goodness sake, is that what they teach you in ROTC? Bullshit like that. Um, and yeah, it's kind of funny. This just this idea of patriots being lied to for the, you know, convenience of spreading a message or whatever. So in this case, they were being told that the peace symbol had been manufactured by the Russians as an attempt to undermine American authority and stuff. Because wouldn't that be convenient as opposed to the peace symbol just being a spontaneous movement amongst the people to try and make positive change in the world? It's easier to write it off if it's just a Russian thing, isn't it? So I like this bit here as well, especially because I'm currently trying to quit smoking uh, again. He took a deep drag on the Winston, then coughed out stale hot smoke. 
Black dots began a sudden dance in the afternoon brightness, and he looked down at the cigarette between his fingers with an expression of nearly comic horror. What was he doing starting up with this shit again? Was he crazy? Well, yes, of course he was crazy. Anyone who saw dead old ladies sitting beside them in their cars had to be crazy, but that didn't mean he had to start up with this shit again. Cigarettes were Agent Orange that you paid for. Cheers, Biggie. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy this. I thought the uh, Vietnam War references were quite interesting. Obviously, as this was actually released in 2020, I guess they were kind of, in a way, like a little bit dated even then when they came out. But that's good because it's kind of looking back at the war and that's kind of the point of this. Um, it's not his best collection by any means, uh, but it, it probably, I, I enjoyed it more or maybe as much as If It Bleeds, which I read recently. I, I, I'd give this like a 3.5 out of 5. It was just all right. But I'm very glad to have ticked it off. And now I can finally watch the movie, which is sitting there on my Netflix watch later list. So there you have it. That's what I made of Hearts in Atlantis. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. So I like this bit here as well, especially because I'm currently trying to quit smoking uh, again. <laughs> He took a deep drag on the Winston, then coughed out stale hot smoke. Black dots began a sudden dance in the afternoon brightness, and he looked down at the cigarette between his fingers with an expression of nearly comic horror. What was he doing starting up with this shit again? Was he crazy? Well, yes, of course he was crazy. Anyone who saw dead old ladies sitting beside them in their cars had to be crazy, but that didn't mean he had to start up with this shit again. Cigarettes were Agent Orange that you paid for. Cheers, Biggie. So yeah, all in all, I did enjoy this. I thought the uh, Vietnam War references were quite interesting. Obviously, as this was actually released in 2020, I guess they were kind of, in a way, like a little bit dated even then when they came out. But that's good because it's kind of looking back at the war and that's kind of the point of this. Um, it's not his best collection by any means, uh, but it, it probably, I, I enjoyed it more or maybe as much as If It Bleeds, which I read recently. I, I, I'd give this like a 3.5 out of 5. It was just all right. But I'm very glad to have ticked it off. And now I can finally watch the movie, which is sitting there on my Netflix watch later list. So there you have it. That's what I made of Hearts in Atlantis. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book. If you read it, hit that like button. If you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more. And I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.